Hi, this is Matt Skinner with a special announcement. Our fall campaign is officially underway and off to a great start. This week, we are celebrating Working Preacher as a community of interpretation. No single tradition or person has exclusive insight into the Word of God. That's why we gather together a collection of faithful interpreters who bring a broad range of voices and perspectives. Your gifts help us keep this community of interpretation wide, inviting, outward facing, insightful, and sometimes challenging, but always focused on what emerges when we dive into the scriptures together. Join me in giving thanks for the interpreters we learn from at Working Preacher. Go to workingpreacher.org today to make your gift securely online. Thank you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, which this, this year falls on November 12, 2023, are Amos chapter 5, verses 18 through 24. Our alternate first reading is Joshua 24, 1 through 3a, and then 14 through 25. Psalm 70, we continue our reading through 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18, and Matthew 25, 1 through 13. And so as we enter into this uh, chapter of Matthew, Matthew 25, before the beginning of the uh, Passion narrative in 26, this is what I said last Sunday. I'm really, I'm holding on to those blessings big time as we move through the next three Sundays, this chapter 25 of Matthew. So I'm holding tight to those blessings as, uh, yeah, as we get these parables. Yeah, you got three challenging ones in a row. People will think, didn't you read that one last week? Yeah. <laughs> Not because I remember the endings to these, but uh, yeah. I I think these are just dreadfully important parables <laughs> for Matthew. And I think we have to first and foremost be aware that where they sit. So they fit in the last major discourse in Matthew, all of 24 and 25. And Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And they ask him about signs and about, about the temple and and, and what are the signs of the end of the age? And he has his temple discourse, which is as well a little scary. Uh, so we'll get that coming up even when we hit Advent 1 in Mark's gospel. But then he follows it up with these statements about preparations and about not falling asleep or about being aware, being prepared. And so it's part of equipping his followers for a life in the midst of a whole lot of turmoil where the urgency of the gospel remains quite present. So whatever you think about the parables, I think we have to respect the context. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you m mentioned that, uh, Matt, because we can, we can go through Matthew and then, well, really any text and kind of forget where we are uh, and what difference does that make. And so we're, some say 24, one through the end of 25 is the, the you know, the eschatological discourse of, of Jesus and Matthew. And so that, that's, that overall theological theme of, of eschatology, of being ready of what's to come the day, the day of the Lord, the end times, that kind of thing is, uh, is, in and of itself is a very important um, theological theme here that uh, that we need to think about. And we perhaps don't, I, I think, uh, well, I don't know. I wonder if, if our eschatology runs a little thin sometimes mm -hmm. when it comes, um, it, you know, that we don't, we don't know how to talk about it. Uh, it's, it's talked about in such odd and challenging ways in sort of common conversation. And so where and how can a preacher speak about eschatology and as a major theological theme in Christian thinking, uh, particularly from this perspective? And then just to remember that then, you know, 26.1 is the beginning of the passion narrative, right? So uh, it's a, it's a, these are, these are, uh, 
these are important parables to situate, like you said, in that overall, in that overall theme of, of how do we talk, how we, how do we talk about eschatology? What do we think about it? Um, how do these parables help us to imagine what that means in Christian thinking? I read the parable kind of now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, listening to you and remembering just the 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 this situation that this text is uh, uh, in the context of it, uh, you're very right, and I think your challenge to us, Caroline, is is very important. Um, and the, uh, listening to the two of you, I turn myself to the last verse, which tells us that um, we don't know. Um, we need to remember we don't know. We can't figure it out. Um, Jesus is always saying the kingdom of heaven is like, and this is a passage that begins that way. Um, it's, it's, it is always a metaphor, not a, um, uh, not a law. Uh, and uh, I think what we try to do when, uh, too often when we, when we get into how do I talk about eschatology is we try to say, well, if you look at these things, we can figure out exactly what's, when it's going to be. Mm. And if you do these things, this is going to happen. If you don't do these things, that that will happen. And I think this text has often been explored that way. You know, five of uh, foolish, five wise, um, and um, uh, which are you? Are you going to be responsible? Are you going to to be prepared? Um, and maybe it's because I've just been looking uh, at the Ten Commandments rather deeply this uh, last term. But uh, the Ten Commandments, not as principles, but as a way of life, uh, suggest to me to read these texts, this parable this way. Uh, and that is, what would it mean if what, what's happening here is just the reality that someone at some point or another told you to always be ready? And... Do you follow that wisdom? Do you obey? Or do you not? Which is called foolishness here. And, and so it, it, it takes this whole grander idea. Um, we talk about uh, the book of Matthew where Jesus looks like Moses. So Ma Moses gave us the Ten Commandments that we turn into principles. And it's really a way of life. And then Jesus comes and uses the same style but as a way of life, it is his way of life. And then he describes the kingdom of God, not in principles, but as a way of life. So what if instead of interpreting this text as, are you wise or are you foolish? That instead we say, um, are you obeying? Is your way of life where others will see you and say, I wish I had followed their way. I wish I had prepared my lamp. That, 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 that I said, I looked at this kind of in a now sentence. Yeah. <laughs> I want to build on that because I like what you're doing, Joy. And I think um, no matter what we do with this parable, we're importing something. We're importing an imagination for what does it mean to be a bridesmaid? Uh, who is this bridegroom and why in the world is he so late? Um, <laughs> all those kinds of questions we have to import either imaginatively or from somewhere else in the gospel. Otherwise, the parable is just really, really cryptic and a little scary. Even when you do import stuff, it's still a little bit cryptic and still a little scary. <laughs> but but I, I would add to what you're saying. So you said, um, imagine that what you're told is it's your job to be ready. Like that's. I would add to that too, what are the consequences of your not being ready? In other words, what happens if half of the bridal party is not prepared. Another way of putting that is who's going to suffer because of your foolishness. Mm. Um, again, this isn't spelled out in the parable, but the bridesmaids are people of some privilege. They've been invited to have a, a, a particular role in an important ceremony. People are depending upon them for more than just having a lamp lit, but and there's something there. So their foolishness isn't just they miss the party, but I think some, I think implied is something else goes wrong or somebody else pays a cost for their foolishness, which isn't a message we want to hear. But if it's a if it's a criticism of disciples who neglect 
the gift given to them or the obligation given to them or the ministry given to them, then we have to ask who suffers when the church is foolish or when the church wastes its time and wastes its resources on things that aren't about mercy. Wow. Well, yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And it also, it makes me, I mean, I think that too, what you have here in terms of that obedience or in terms of that responsibility, I, I mean, I hear, I, I hear lamps and this is, and I, I hear lamps and I, it takes me, I mean, again, we're coming, we're at the end of, you know, we're at, at the end of Jesus ministry before the passion narrative. It takes me back to the beginning and you are the light of the world. Uh, and what happens when that light doesn't shine? Um, what are the, like you said, what are the consequences of, 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 of those lamps not being lit and not having enough oil for those lamps being lit? And so I uh, it <clears throat> I think putting it in that that context too of those those first words that Jesus says to his disciples is really uh is really important. The other thing I find fascinating about this passage is we've had, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, and here we have the kingdom of heaven will be like this. And so there's something really, I think, poignant about that, that if you hear it, particularly in the context of the next passage is the passion narrative, you know, the arrest of Jesus, that Jesus is, uh, Jesus is pushing this kingdom forward, particularly at a time when it looks like that kingdom could come crashing down uh, with the passion narrative and with the death of Jesus and pushing that kingdom forward. But at the same time, that's why the, that obedience is so important. That's why, uh, that's why being the light and being the salt of the earth is so important is that that kingdom of heaven will be like, because of in part keeping our lamps burning. And so, so hearing that promise of that future reality is also a call to uh is a call to us to continue to be that light and and particularly a light when when the next part of the gospel goes into a very very dark place you you have us looking forward in the text um it also invites us uh with the themes that you both have just laid down uh, it also invites us to look back in what we've said to our congregations in the last few Sundays. Um, what is the reality that your congregation is in right now? And how does this message of uh, this congregation, this community, this church um, being faithful, um, accepting its responsibility uh, to be the light in the world, um, how has what you've already been communicating, how does that move forward to, to through this passage um, um, so that we're, we're both uh, weaving together uh, what the text is saying, but also how that text is heard uh, in, in our communities today? Yeah. yeah. I, I like that because, you know, the last several weeks we've had many texts about conflict with religious leaders. Exactly. And we've been encouraging people to, you know, tread very carefully here. Like, don't perpetuate negative stereotypes, damaging stereotypes. But at the same time, we've said, of course, Jesus is going to hold accountable religious leaders who he thinks are falling short. Uh, chapter 21, the parable of the wicked tenants is maybe the best example of that. So it, I just, having done all of that, <laughs> I think it's kind of ironic that sometimes interpreters get to chapter 25 and they say, well, this can't really be Jesus. This can't really be. Yeah. So we're happy to say, look at all the ways in which Jesus is saying, did you not think there would be consequences <laughs> to, to your resisting God or to your resisting your calling as religious leaders? And now here's a parable that I think he's addressing to his insiders. And we say like, oh, it's not really about that. <laughs> I mean, it's, do we really think that he will not hold the church accountable. Now, I'm not saying this means you're going to get tossed into outer darkness for all eternity. We have to deal with that language and its symbolism in its own way. But um, 
don't get excited about where he criticizes the Jewish leaders and now where he's turning to the quote unquote Christian leaders yeah. and all of a sudden turn the parable upside down or do all you can to take Jesus out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, I have no real strong opinions. <laughs> well, I wish you would. I wish you'd. <laughs> well, there's, we got two more weeks with these parables. Who knows what's going to happen? But when you get to the sheep and the goats, it's impossible to take Jesus out of that one. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. That's right. That's so. right. Yeah. Well, in many respects, uh, what where you just were, uh, where, the where we just landed, it, I'm I'm going to Amos, the Amos passage, <laughs> uh, and that I'm that the way in which you, what what how is it that uh, that our loyalty and obedience to God gets manifested, and and what is it that people see? So so. Amos is, of course, a uh, critique of despise your festivals, take no delight in your solemn assemblies, uh, the noise of your songs. I love that phrase. Like, <laughs> you know, how many songs are just so noisy and don't really say or sing anything? I would point, and then, of course, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. And I, I would point people to the commentary by Carolyn Sharp, which is just outstanding. And particularly as she, it, the, the way in which we think about how liturgy is a manifestation of what we believe, who uh, it, it is a performance of what we think who God is and, and how we embody that. And the relationship between, as she says, uh, between liturgy and justice. And that I think that has so, so many rich connections with what we've already said with, with the math, Mathian parable. Um, when we think about, you know, what, how is it that our lamps are, are shining liturgy and worship is one way. And what is that, what is that really representing? What is that showing people? And so. throughout, uh, and I can't remember now, uh, whether it was you, Caroline, or Matt, who, as we were looking at the Methian um, uh, parable, used we language. Um, uh, and I, I think I, I wanted to highlight that because um, sometimes when we read this, we, we, we communicate, or when we preach this, we communicate it so that people hear it individually. Um, and um, as we were talking about it, um, Whichever one you said it, you, you said it in a we context. Mm -hmm. And um, this idea that when we gather together, that's picked up so so well in the commentary, as we gather together, we are singing our liturgy, um, strikes me with the idea that I talked about in terms of what does it mean to obey? Because uh, this, this text isn't asking us to obey a 59-minute order of worship. It's asking us to obey a 365, 24-7 way of life. And that way of life, as another uh, prophet will say it, is simply to love justice, uh, to uh, practice kindness, and, and to, to honor God. And, and so this is not uh, unique among the prophets to talk about justice. In fact, that is what the commandments are about. That's what it means to love our neighbor. And so our words, which sometimes are comforting for us individually, or sometimes are a great, um, a great brand, they become empty, not merely before God, but before those for whom we're to let our light shine. Because they say, I wish the church actually did what they sang or what mm. they said. And mm. I think that's what makes Amos such a, tread lightly as you read this, but definitely tread through this. <laughs> yeah, I like that you brought in Micah 6, 8 there, Joy, not to fix Amos, but to say this is the broader context. And this is, a, I think, an important Sunday to for a preacher to explain, I'm not here to fix these texts. I'm not here to make these texts uh, make you smile and go home feeling good about yourself. But I'm also not here to terrify you with these texts or to teach you that the Bible, that a, that a passage stands alone in the Bible that we're all in. So to show them, 
look, I'm preaching this out of Matthew 25, the same gospel in which Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden light. Do we choose between one of those or do we somehow find them in a creative and sometimes scary tension and to invite people into, oh, that's right. This sits in a larger witness of scripture. Um, that's where the, the authors, if they're not aware of each other's work, the theology seem to be aware of each other. And yet they're both coming forward, right? One that's that's a lot more heavy handed and one that appears to be welcoming and easy. And maybe they're both true in their own way. Well, we'll never get through the semi-continuous. Oh, true. <laughs> Fortunately, we skipped but, most of Joshua. <laughs> right. But, but, uh, but the themes though, I mean, th this, uh, I, I'm just struck by where our conversation has gone with regard to obedience. And as you said, I mean, this is the choice that's brought before uh, that's, that's brought before the people. Again, I would point people to the, the commentary by Brian Whitfield, which is really superb on this. And, but particularly the last paragraph, um, last couple of paragraphs, we may choose to center our lives on the power of the past, on family tradition or ancestral piety, longing for what once was. We may choose to shape our lives around the values of the prevailing consumer culture, trimming our horizons to the demands of market forces. Both choices ensnare us in the power of sin and death. Or we may choose an identity not based on nostalgia or cultural accommodation, but on the grace of a God of liberating love who leads us into a new era of freedom for life and community in a land of promise. The choice, as Joshua reminds us, is ours. I just think that is just brilliant. And the other, and but it is a choice. Choose whom you will serve, whom you will serve. And I don't, I, I, I think we've talked about this over the years, but People ask me, you know, how do we prepare for this? And we, you know, that we don't script it, but we prepare and we read the commentaries and we do our own work with the text. And I, I was, you know, reading through the text and I'm just going to show this on our, like, if you're watching this, like, look at all the serves there. I circled all of them. Serve, 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 <laughs> serve, 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 serve. Like, so if you're listening to this, you have to go to the YouTube video to see, like I held up my paper and I circled serve. I mean, that's the choice. Whom will you serve? And I think you can make a connection back to some of the themes that we've already talked about. And, but it is a choice and that, and the choice that you make then is manifested in who you are and how you are and what you do. So. I appreciate that, and I appreciate you lifting up uh, the commentary as well. I'm gonna I'm gonna slip in a little bit on on the context because um, um, recent scholarship has really paid attention. Um, um, in, in a way, we should pay attention to the violence that is in Joshua and in Judges, and uh, so we're kind of grateful to be able to read this particular passage where <laughs> Joshua is, you know, saying, "Who are you going to serve?" Um, but I want to put it in the context uh, where. Um, the, as the commentary uh, notes, um, Joshua doesn't ex accept their immediate, yes, we will serve. Yes, we will. Um, and the reason is um, how the story will play out. In um, When Joshua dies, we find ourselves with a generation that ha has not seen what God has done. And that would be the book of Judges, a generation that the, the Joshua and all those who had seen what the Lord had done had died and they don't serve God. And that's why Judges is such a horrible book. Um, but in, in Joshua, we see Joshua's calling the people to faithfully obey. And in that, we see the violence different. It's still violent. But it's different than uh, the human-directed violence that we see throughout Judges. And I lift that up because I'm going all the way back to Matthew and Caroline, where you were saying, um, what, is the what do the people see the church as the light? How do they see us as shining the light? And that's what uh, 
Joshua is calling for here. It's the same call that Moses was giving to Israel. Will you be the descendants of the one that that God promised? Your descendants will be a nation that is a blessing to all the other nations. The context of Joshua is the context of the whole canon. And to read it as not just, um, I want to, I want to, I want to, from my uh, position, critique the violence, but rather, am I in need of being repeatedly asked, who am I serving? Psalm 70 is a nice then, woe is me, <laughs> in response <laughs> to three hard texts, right? Deliver me, help me. Please. Yeah. <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> in the last, in the last, uh, last verse there, the the intensity of this. Um, yeah. Not a bad text to weave in, not to not to deliver you from the other texts, but right to but to put us back onto the mercy of God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or to acknowledge the failure that a good word or a good worship. To go back to Amos, um, we're doing the right things but we aren't practicing the justice. And for mm-hmm. that, we need to say, oh, God, help me. That's what I would do is weave it into, you know, what we've, what we some of the things that we've already talked about that, yeah, we need God's help for, <laughs> for a lot of this. And then we've, uh, we've been working through, of course, First Thessalonians, and we have one of the more, I think, well-known passages of Thessalonians, the the uh, apocalyptic discourse or the eschatological discourse, which of course relates to um, the Matthew passage in that regard of of the coming of uh, the coming of Christ, but it's uh, it it is a uh, it's a beautiful passage that of course often gets turned into you know. A, Combined with other passages in Scripture, to uh, to be a passage that is uh, that causes grief or that causes worry about you know some sort of uh, some sort of well, I'm thinking about like the left behind, you know, the rapture and all of that kind of stuff. And <laughs> there he goes, he's gone, right? And which is just so foreign to what this passage is doing. Right, that this passage is coming from this place of of deep pastoral care. That the people of of this church are like, okay, you know, Grandma Martha died, and you said right. <laughs> Jesus was going to come back in our lifetime. So what happens? And and then this, you know, of course, drawing on uh, that apocalyptic tradition of hope and promise and encouragement uh, is what this passage is meant to do. So sometimes. I will often tell my students that our our sermons need to be correctives mm-hmm. to misinterpretations of texts or misunderstandings of texts, and I think this could be one where you're saying, "No, this is not to, you know, not to support the rapture or uh, the Left Behind series. It's meant to speak into that deep sense of loss of of what of what we might imagine our reunite our reunion with our loved ones to look like." When we remember that this is one of the first letters, uh, the first books of the New Testament to be written, um, and that we don't get this idea that has become um, this definition of rapture, which isn't anywhere in the Bible. Uh, We don't get that in later texts. Um, But this text, as you just described, is exactly that. It's like, we really thought Jesus was coming back immediately. And so I, we need you to understand we have hope and we live even through our suffering with this hope. And that circles, as you said so well, Caroline, back with Matthew. Um, we don't know the day or the hour, but we hope and wait. This anticipates next week also, where you'll get chapter five, verses one through 11, which, which continues what Paul's talking about here. Interesting that both sections end with encourage one another with these words, which mm-hmm. Paul himself tells us how to use this. And like you were saying, Caroline, it's not about uh, threaten or terrorize one another with these words. 
<laughs> Next week, we'll talk a bit more about the, the, the countercultural nature of this Christian grieving and this Christian expectation, which I think is really important. Uh, and again, this is, I don't know if I would, this would be too much for a sermon, but this should also, I think, instruct us with what's going on in Matthew, that part of what's happening there there's a carrot as well as a stick, so to speak, right? There's, there's, those are not just threatening parables, but encouragements, I think, to step up and to get involved where God is involved in the world. Um, and that takes us back to the Beatitudes. Um, I, I would hope Paul would agree. 